Okay, and we are live on Facebook. So, hi everybody. My name is Ren Manning. I'm the social justice coordinator at the Granite Peak Unitarian Universalist Congregation, and I will be the moderator for tonight's panel discussion. Thank you all so much for being here. And a couple logistics before we a couple logistics before we get started. As attendees, um, along the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A icon, which you can click to submit questions to the panelists that we will answer at the end. And you can also see a chat icon, um, which some of you have already found, which looks like a little speech bubble. And you can use the chat to write directly to the panelists or to Carrie Hull um, with tech questions or to all attendees and panelists. And um, yeah, again, we'll go ahead and answer the questions at the end. Um, and so I'm gonna go over some framing on why we are having this panel tonight. I will introduce each panelist and they will share, and then we'll have some time for question and answers and more discussion. So feel free to submit questions as panelists are talking and um, they'll be answered at the end. And uh, go ahead and indicate if it's supposed to be for a specific person. So, why are we here today? It is the 23rd year of our Empty Bowls fundraiser for food banks in Yavapai County, with the support of artists, restaurants, and community members. We embrace a holistic understanding of social justice and social change. So we know that while it's critical to support these emergency food resources for people experiencing hunger, we also know that we must understand the root causes of hunger, how race, gender, class, power, climate change impact this, how we must advocate for laws, equitable access to resources, and we must organize so we can actually transform our food system. So we're here today to learn about food justice and food sovereignty. Um, want to offer you a definition of food insecurity. The U.S. Department of Agriculture defines food insecurity as a lack of consistent access to enough food for an active, healthy life. So this year you can um, visit the Empty Bowls website and order a bowl, which can then be picked up on September 13th or 19th. You can participate in our 50-50 drawing and art auction or donate. Um, and you can, um, when you get your bowls, you will get a, a recipe for stone soup. That's our phone, our uh, fun version this year. Um, and we're going to have a finale over Zoom on September 13th at 4 p.m. as well. So this panels co-sponsored by Empty Bowls of Prescott Committee, which is Granite Peak UU Congregation, Prescott UU Fellowship, and also the Northern Arizona Climate Change Alliance. And I'm going to turn it over to Carrie Hall to say a couple minutes about that organization. Hello, I am the community organizer for Northern Arizona Climate Change Alliance, and we're extremely grateful to have been asked um, to co-sponsor this event with um, Granite Peak. It's an amazing cause and fundraiser, and um, we really put forward some outreach efforts, and it looks like it paid off. We have lots of people on tonight and um, thank you for being patient with us as we got things rolling. <laughs> it's so nice to be among friends and um, if you don't already know about NASCA, which is the acronym for Northern Arizona Climate Change Alliance, our vision and mission is to work at a um, local community level as a grassroots organization, educating and empowering the community to learn about climate change and then take action to um, mitigate and hopefully someday uh, reverse the climate crisis and emergency that we're in. So um, taking small personal steps along with um, local, statewide, national, and global efforts on policy and law. So, um, that's basically who and what we are. Um, I, I, if you don't already get emails from us, um, 
I'll touch base with you after this um, program and see if you want to jump on our email database. We have a great newsletter and also we send out um, to the areas in which we work um, um, special events that are coming up like this one. Um, so thank you very much for having me. And Oh, I'm going off camera because I am here to help on the tech side. So um, everybody enjoy the program and thanks for having me. Thanks, Carrie. So our first panelist um, today will be Rebecca Serratos. And Rebecca was raised in Prescott, Arizona and graduated from Prescott College in 2012 with a competency in political studies and an emphasis in social justice education. She is currently a program coordinator with the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension in Yavapai County and works throughout the county in a variety of venues concerning equitable access to healthy, affordable food with a grant from the United States Department of Agriculture. She is a recent graduate of the Master Gardener program and just completed her certificate in production horticulture at Yavapai College. Rebecca can usually be found in her backyard with her two daughters wrangling chickens or staking beans. Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and thanks for letting me be here. I'm excited for this group. I was stoked to see that Empty Bowls, um, such a cornerstone event for our community here in Prescott. And so for it to be able to go online and still happen is really amazing. So thanks for all the work that I know happened to make that. Um, so yeah, food systems. It is a really varied topic. And I'm going to try to take a broader view because I know a lot of our panelists are going to get a little bit more into depth into what they do specifically. But I work for Cooperative Extension. Um, that in and of itself could be a topic. But for those of you that were asking about how do you grow things, where do I get information or knowledge about growing in this climate, uh, Cooperative Extension is a nationwide service. So you should look up Cooperative Extension in your area. Uh, in Yavapai County, we have two offices and we're housed out of the University of Arizona. Um, within Cooperative Extension, I run what's called SNAP Education. So nowadays, SNAP is Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Back in the day, it was the food stamp program. Now, food stamps have been around in some form or fashion since the early 1940s. This is a government program that has undergone a monstrous amount of change. Um, whole novels are written on how much SNAP has changed or food stamp benefits have changed and the reasoning behind those changes. But a few things still remain true today regarding hunger and access that were true back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, the first one is... The, this big question of how to balance program access, so access to benefits and nutrition security with program accountability. Um, fraud becomes a big deal in the food stamp world. Um, government spending also becomes a big deal in the food stamp world. Um, and so those two things are always kind of battled over depending either at the local, the state or the national level. Um, who's eligible for these programs is also like a very contentious topic and ever changing. If you've been paying attention to the news lately, uh, SNAP is being turned on its head as we speak due to COVID. Um, in as of 2017, four, four, $414 million has been spent on SNAP nationwide, which is an insane amount of money. Um, but what I do here kind of more locally in our little microcosm of the world is I try to help communities make the healthy choice the easy choice. Now, this can take a variety of forms and look a variety of ways depending on where you're at. Um, and it's meant to be like that. But here in Yavapai County, I think we do a really good job at taking a systems approach to this sort of work. Um, so I'm really glad that Ren started us off with that definition of food insecurity because it drives a lot of our work here at the county level. Um, I also get really into food access and food deserts. So food access can be thought of as like the spatial accessibility of food and food supports. 
Um, so in our neck of the woods, in Yavapai County, it's travel time, drive time. How long do you have to drive to get a fresh apple? That is a question that many people don't normally ask themselves, but in certain parts of the state and definitely certain parts of Yavapai County, that becomes problematic. Uh, local data from our community health improvement plan shows that people have self-reported that about 24% of Yavapai County residents drive six or more miles to access a full service grocery store. So if you're in the Prescott Quad City area, that's like Gail Gardner, Walmart on Gail Gardner driving to Costco just to get any sort of food um, to, to purchase. What's even more drastic is that about three and a half percent of residents self-reported that they're driving over 21 miles to get anything that is fresh and edible. Now this becomes even more severe when you get up to Navajo Nation. Um, people up there report almost 80 miles of getting anything fresh at any sort of store, be it a corner store, a convenience store, et cetera. Um, so knowing that food access is a big deal, that also kind of delves into food deserts, right? We have a lot of lack of infrastructure, a lot of just open kind of rambling spaces in Yavapai County that we're really known for, right? It does absolutely nothing to help feed people, however, right? Big box grocery stores, full service um, setups and venues are really there to service all community members, but especially the most vulnerable. And it might not be idyllic in terms of our sweeping landscapes, but food, food systems and food access in those landscapes is needs to be a conversation that I feel like we have really yet to have here locally in Yavapai County. And what I mean by that is in say our community health improvement plan for both the Verde Valley and Western Quad City area, food access wasn't even slated as a top priority to be put into that plan. Access to care, mental health, substance use disorders, all kind of topped this idea um, of what was more important versus actually accessing food. And then you get into the very local level of city council members, different city councils, board of supervisors, um, having yet to really take a stance on what food access and food security looks like here locally. So we have a lot of ground to make up. Um, However, I think there's a lot of things going on at the very grassroots level and with a lot of nonprofits that we'll hear from one of them today that are doing a really amazing amount of work regarding food access and food insecurity in Yaupai County. Um, a, re a more recent kind of broader view of this in the COVID pandemic is SNAP benefits supply nine meals to every one emergency food meal that is provided to the family or to families. So empty bowls being a really pivotal event, giving money to food banks, food pantries, emergency food outlets is crucial because we're seeing those outlets being overwhelmed with people who have never, ever, ever used those services before. And we know, those of us in this work know that those outlets will not solve the problem of hunger in our communities. And actually, uh, we're starting to see people be turned away because of lack of food in those institutions. And so know that there's a fine balance between people being able to provide for themselves, use benefits and um, other forms of food assistance to buy both culturally rele relevant foods, so like foods that they actually know how to prepare and eat, that's huge, right? Instead of back in the day, people would get a big block of government cheese and not know what to do with it, right? Nowadays, you have your benefits loaded on a card and you're able to make purchases that are right for you and your families. Um, so know that emergency food is but one issue, SNAP benefits, TANF, WIC is but another issue. Um, and all of these kind of coalesce in what is our community members, our families and our individuals. Know that food insecurity and hunger don't have just one face 
in this community where people who rely on these forms of assistance are as varied as all of us here on this call. You know, I, when I first started having children, definitely relied on WIC um, to help supplement our income. I was not a working mom at that point. And so WIC benefits totally came in and were appropriate for my family at that time, right? Um, and so it's ever changing, it's very dynamic and fluid. Um, so yeah, I wanted, I wanted to kind of start us off with a broader view, um, but then also more of like a county view as to what's happening here in our little corner of Northern Arizona. Um, and I will plug my email address into the chat box. I would love to hear from any and all of you and I look forward to the rest of the panel. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Rebecca. And thank you for um, really inspiring us to have critical conversations that maybe we're not having now. So thank you for that. Our next panelist is Amanda Honwaijiwa, who is on the Yavapai Apache Na uh, Nation Tribal Council. She is an advocate for food sovereignty in indigenous communities, environmental sustainability, and self-sufficiency. She is the creator of the Backyard Gardening Movement Group, and she is educated in holistic nutrition. Amanda, take it away. All right, thank you. And I just want to apologize in advance. Um, if you catch any background noise, I am sitting outside. So I just, you know, I enjoy this environment here. All right. Uh, well, I just want to start off. Maham chika, gumiuche, yamolich, Amanda Hanwaitua, yafpe, hawaja, huijum. So hello, how are you all? My name is Amanda Hanwaitua. I am from the Yavapai Apache Nation. I am also Hopi, which is where my last name comes from, meaning the bear has walked and my clan is spider. I would like to start off by stating how thankful I am to have this uh, opportunity to speak here today. And I am too looking forward to the discussion, uh, you know, surrounding and involving food justice. For me, I am hoping to bring uh, more insight and enthusiasm on a movement I am most passionate about, which is uh, growing your own food and how it plays a vital role in food security. I am an advocate for food sovereignty in indigenous communities, particularly on a community-based level. So as mentioned, I do currently run a Facebook group page called the Backyard Gardening Movement. I created this group to encourage individuals, whether beginners or experienced gardeners, to share their experience and knowledge so that it may inspire and continue to motivate others to grow their own food. For me, I believe food security starts in our own backyards. And by taking that initiative to plant our own fruits, vegetables, and herbs, we are promoting self-sufficiency and essentially reclaiming our own health. When we begin to evaluate the current situation we are in with the COVID-19 pandemic it's, and its impact on the community and the larger, excuse me, the economy, we realize how vulnerable our current food system is and that the lack of access to food, specifically healthful foods, is a real issue in our country, especially amongst those, uh, those minority and working class peoples. So what do we do about it? That is the posing question that I am eager to address and hear from this diverse panel. I briefly mentioned, you know, one of my solutions, which is backyard gardening. I use the term movement because together we are working towards a systematic change, not only on how our food is produced, but how we value the, uh, excuse me, how the value we place on producing that food. So I will share um, just real quick uh, how proud my participants are in my group page uh, when they harvest their own crops. So a lot of the times, you know, they, they share pictures of, you know, what's going on in their garden, uh, pictures of their fruits and their vegetables. 
and they're all so excited, you know, to share with the rest of us. And it is a very rewarding experience. And I'm sure, you know, we are well aware of the benefits gardening has on both our physical and mental health, uh, which is another important aspect to keep in mind when considering the effects of this pandemic. Um, one other project I am involved in is the Yavapai Apache Nation Food Sovereignty Pilot Project. Now, this project, um, I am always excited to talk about it because it actually came from a vision of a tribal member, and her name is uh, Angel Martinez. By utilizing tribal resources and partnering with the Yavapai Apache Nation Environmental Protection Department, she was able to find a small area of land in her local community and build a garden, which is now known as the Garden of Life. And this year, um, you know, she did have some drawbacks in regards to, you know, when the pandemic hit, but she was able to pull through and together her, I and, and all, a lot of other volunteers were able to plant a three sisters garden plot of corn, bean and squash. And uh, just recently she had planted um, some seeds for the uh, fall season. So for me, I just, I really find this story so inspiring because it goes to show how one motivated in individual can create positive change in her local community. Not only did she take on a huge responsibility, but is committed to providing her family and local community access to those health, um, those healthy fresh foods. For the, um, the Garden of Life, she plans to continue growing traditional culture appropriated foods and medicinal plants. And it, I just really find it uh, an honor to be a part of such a vision. So I was really excited to uh, share that with you guys today. And I did mention to her that I was going um, to bring it up here. But in the bigger picture, when it comes to food sovereignty from an indigenous perspective, it is very important because when we think about the history of indigenous people in America, we were stripped of our lands and essentially denied access to wild game and farming. Cultivating the land and growing the food was a critical part of many indigenous tribes when it came to their culture, their health, and even their roles in the community. Uh, so fortunately, um, and today, you know, I, I personally see many tribes across the nation are reclaiming their food sovereignty by revitalizing agriculture and their traditional practices and the foods um, that they're, you know, that is so important to their health. And with that, you know, comes the reconnection to the land and the appreciation and the push towards protection for all the wonderful natural resources provided, you know, by our mother earth. And that's um, all I have for now. And I, I look forward to, you know, the questions and, and how, you know, me, how I can um, share, you know, both my experience and knowledge on this topic. So thank you, I appreciate it. Thanks, Amanda. Um, yeah, it's really powerful, I think, to think about the tr traditional cultural foods and um, how you were talking about one person being able to make a larger change and talk about food sovereignty. And I really hope that we get to go deeper into that in the discussion as well. So glad you're here. Our next panelist is Kathleen Yetman who is a direct, executive director of Prescott Farmers Market, a small nonprofit based in her hometown of Prescott, Arizona. Kathleen's work is focused on increasing capacity for small farmers and ranchers in Yavapai County, while also ensuring that everyone has access to fresh locally grown foods. Prior to joining Prescott Farmers Market, Kathleen served as Food Corp service member on the Fort Apache Indian Reservation in Eastern Arizona where she served an additional two years as the Arizona Food Corps Fellow. She holds a BA in History from Lewis and Clark College and a Master's Certificate in Food Policy and Sustainable, Sustainability Leadership. 
She feels joy when exploring the garden and tending her fruit trees with her two small children. Thanks so much, Ren. And thanks again for getting this panel together. This is really wonderful. I'm madly scribbling notes, making connections here, which is always a good sign. Um, and good evening to everyone here. Thanks to everyone who's spoken before. So um, yeah, I uh, work for the Prescott Farmers Market here in Prescott. We started in 1997. Uh, so that was a great year because that's also when Empty Bowls started apparently. Um, so we're also 23 years old and uh, started as a really small farmer's market in downtown Prescott and uh, over the years have grown. And so we have about 50 vendors with a focus on Yavapai grown vendors at our market. <clears throat> so uh, a little, just to piggyback on what Rebecca was talking about, Rebecca and I work together a lot on food access um, and have done a lot of really amazing projects and really grateful for U of A's involvement in everything here. So, uh, she, someone asked about WIC, so I wanted to address that real quick. So uh, the farmer's market has uh, several programs that address food access, which Rebecca set up so nicely for us. So uh, we accept SNAP benefits at our market, and we also double SNAP, mark, SNAP benefits at our market. So we have a program called Double Up Food Bucks Arizona, and that is something that is run through a nonprofit in Phoenix and is at several farmer's markets across the state and actually nationally. And this program's amazing because someone can come and swipe their card, their EBT card at the market and can double their money for fresh fruits and vegetables that were grown in Arizona. So this is an amazing program and we're really lucky to be able to participate in it. So this year alone, we have had about $17,000 in SNAP sales at our markets. And we've been able to double that to almost $16,000. And especially when, uh, when COVID hit back in March, we saw a huge increase in that. And uh, I think that it's been a, a, just a really fantastic program right now and very needed. Something else that, that happened this last March uh, is when everybody started going to the grocery store and realized that like food wasn't there or the things they were used to seeing weren't there, um, they came to the farmer's market, which was really exciting for us. Um, when people started actually thinking about where their food comes from and realizing that people grow food and it just doesn't like come from a shelf at the store. And so we saw a lot of people kind of reaching out, trying to learn more about our local growers. And that was really inspiring to see and give me a lot of hope about our local food system. So uh, the other program we have in addition to um, SNAP, the SNAP and the Double Up Food Bucks program is our Farmer's Market Nutrition Program and this is a program that provides a one-time $30 coupon booklet for fresh fruits and vegetables to uh, low-income families. So through the WIC program, which stands for Women, Infants, and Children. And as Rebecca mentioned, she utilized that when she had her, I think, first daughter. I also utilized that when I had my first son. Um, and that provides coupons to uh, mothers who are pregnant, breastfeeding, um, or have small children. And they can go to the store and have checks for specific items. This program is really wonderful because it gives them actual money just to spend specifically at the farmer's market so that they can buy the fresh local foods um, of their choice, which is really great. And uh, there's also a senior, uh, senior program with that. It's the C, I can always, always forget this one. It's a, there's like food box that seniors can get and they can also get access those coupons at our market. So those are two of the biggest programs that we run to increase access to food for all. And I want to acknowledge that that does not mean that everyone gets food. So if you aren't, if you don't qualify for those programs, um, there aren't really systems in place to support a lot of people right now. And I know a lot of people are hurting. So um, one way we are addressing that and continue to address that is we started our Feed Your Neighbors program in March and through generous donations from individuals like you we were able to provide boxes of food to families uh, all over the place. Um, spinach to families out at uh, Humboldt Unified School District when they came to pick up their school lunch. We got boxes to Baghdad, to seniors who were homebound. Um, so we're continuing to look for ways to support those people who are being left out of the system um, of the government systems right now. So uh, we will continue to do that and I'll keep you all updated on our progress. Um, yeah, so one interesting thing about SNAP is that it actually came about, as Rebecca mentioned, in 1939, and it became about because 
farmers needed help and people needed food. And so I think a lot of over the politicization of this, that gets lost, but really it, it was created because farmers were growing so much food in these rural communities, but people in the urban communities couldn't actually afford to purchase it. And so the government st stepped in and provided the food stamp program so that the farmers could get paid for that food they're growing and people could actually eat it instead of you know paying farmers to turn things into their soil because they didn't have a market for it or killing hogs which we just saw like six months ago so it's really interesting to see this kind of cyclical um crisis happen uh it's been really interesting but i think that's a really important thing to note is that it was there to support people who were hungry and also to support farmers and so we're really proud to be able to participate in that program because our farmers continue to benefit from that program when people buy people shop at our market. So um, in addition to our, our market, we have our Prescott market on Saturdays. We just launched a Wednesday market downtown. So you could check it out tomorrow. And in addition to that, we also want to support those farmers in learning more about how to have a successful business. So when you shop in the market, you're supporting a farmer who is growing food for the community, feeding their family, and also paying someone a living wage to harvest vegetables and, and also supporting a family, a small, a small family business. So uh, I'm sure you all are aware of, you know, keeping money local is a really important aspect of our community. So it's a great place to do that. Um, so as a nonprofit, uh, we have done a lot of we had a small food conference a couple years ago. We, our goal is to support farmers in bettering their business. So a lot of our farmers really love to grow food and that's what they're good at and that's their passion, but they don't necessarily want to issue invoices or figure out bookkeeping or anything like that. And so one of our goals is to support them in find, figuring out systems that work for them so that they can increase their markets and have a successful business outside of our market specifically. Um, so those are some of the, the main things we're doing. Two really exciting things I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, it was great to hear Amanda talking about backyard gardens and we have, we have missed our last two, but we have a seed exchange coming up. Um, we finally felt like we could find a way to make that safe at the market. And so it'll be on September 19th at our market um, on Saturdays. And this is a great opportunity for anyone who's been growing food this summer and saving seeds to bring those seeds to share with the community. I know I've got some lettuce seeds and tomato seeds that I've been saving all summer and I'm really excited to share those. Um, but it's also a great place for people to come and get seeds because I know that this year with the peak interest in gardening, which is so wonderful, that seeds have been a little bit more difficult to come by. So, um, so I want to make sure you all know about that and uh, come check it out and get some seeds or bring some seeds. The last thing I wanted to mention is we uh, partnered with the city a couple months ago to apply for a grant for a community scale compost operation. And we were one of 23 awardees out of like 570 applicants. So I'm just like really honored and excited to get started on that program. And we'll be launching that probably this October um, in partnership with the city. So I'll keep you all updated on that, but it's going to be a volunteer community run operation and it's going to make a huge difference for everybody who's gardening or farming in our community. So um, that's it for me. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kathleen. That is very exciting about the compost project. Um, I know that's been in the works. And yeah, I really appreciate the history too that a couple of you have um, tied in here. I think we can really look at this on all of the different levels and scales. And um, so seeing what happens nationally as well as locally and just making that connection between supporting farmers and people who need food um, is really beautiful work. So thank you for that. Our next panelist is Montana Morris, who is the Community Program Manager at Victory Garden in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Montana has gardened and worked on farms for years, including Victory Garden, um, from a very young age, learning how to grow food um, by gardening with her mother. And Montana has a bachelor's 
degree in social justice and agroecology and a master's in social justice and community organizing from Prescott College. From creating and directing the only wet homeless shelter in Arizona, working to stop mine development on sacred indigenous lands, to aiding undocumented asylum seekers on the border of Arizona and Mexico, Montana has a broad passion for social justice, preferring to see things from a system, systems perspective. She believes that food is directly connected to a myriad of individual issues from physical and mental health of individuals, communities and the environment to modern slavery, economic monopolization and the destruction of culture. Montana also loves dogs, rock climbing, paddle boarding, yoga and dancing. She hula hoops in beautiful places and plays songs on the guitar so she can sing out of tune by herself. Hello, thank you for that introduction. Um, that was very good. So <clears throat> I appreciate for uh, having me here and to talk to everyone. And I guess uh, my perspective will be a little broader, a little different since I'm all the way in uh, Wisconsin now. But I live and work um, in a low-income neighborhood of Milwaukee, mostly black neighborhood. Um, as you know, Milwaukee is one of the most segregated cities in America, so it's very noticeable um, how it affects the culture. Um, the organization I work for started about 12 years ago, and we <laughs> uh, got a large chunk of land in the city, one and a half acres, to grow food, start a community farm, provide that food to the community. Um, so that's been great. Uh, but it is a process from this organization that was originally started um, from people that did not live in the community but came to the community to help, to provide the resources and the knowledge that they had to get things up and running, that food growing knowledge, um, that organizing knowledge, and that fundraising knowledge. Um, but I have been brought into the organization to kind of shift um, the organization a little more away from the charity-based service model that is typical of the nonprofit industrial complex and try to gear it a little more towards the community itself and being a community-led organization. Um, our goals have been transitioning away from using the farm to provide food to the community to using the farm to teach the people how to grow the food on the farm and then to pay them to teach their neighbors how to grow that food and then to just kind of slowly wiggle into the background and hopefully disappear. Um, so a lot of what we do or what I do is really just on the ground organizing work getting to know the neighbors, getting to know the people, building those relationships and connections so that I can figure out as a trained organizer, you know, who in the community has what skills and how I can help um, them to realize that they have these skills. Because a lot of times people have a lot of skills that, you know, they've been trained to not believe are as worthful um, within themselves and figure out how we can all help and be a part of that um, because not only is the knowledge of how to grow food and cook the food disappearing but there's also um, that connection in general of community that's disappearing so making sure you know to know your neighbors is the first step of any community organization. Um, the farm has always been open to the community. People can come in. There's no locks. You know, anybody can take whatever food they would like. But um, over time, there's been not necessarily as much engagement as, you know, idealistic me would like in that and realizing that a lot of it has to do um, with the racial tension of the organization are you know are, we have been working on doing a cultural and a color transition of our organization and now have 50 percent um, people of color working for the organization and on the board um, and we've immediately saw that transition with the types of people that come to the farm you really see that follow um, and as i've been working to get the teachers that teach the classes of how to grow food and how to cook, can process that food. Um, as I transition those teachers to be teachers of color as well, I just get influxes of people that are very excited and wanna come um, 
to these classes and events. So that's really where I focus. Um, it's difficult. It is definitely difficult work to do that kind of transition uh, in an organization because we all have so much of our own um, subconscious biases that make it difficult, even if we really want to do that transition. You know, there's a lot of white women like myself that are running nonprofit boards all over the country that want to do that great work. Um, but it can be hard, especially if you haven't been immersed into these cultures that you're working with. It can be hard to actually visualize what it looks like to change culturally, change your organization, to be led by the people. Um, because it you know, it doesn't look like one of my struggles right now um, is trying to explain that it doesn't look like black people doing white things. <laughs> it doesn't look like, you know, having a person of color being like, hey, I want you to run this organization. Here's this is how you do it. Can you do this for me, please? Um, and it really looks like using that power that I have at having a job at this organization to step back and be like, well, what does the community think we should do here? You know, um, because one big main thing that we get a lot of times is why should people really care? Like people that are in crisis mode all the time, like the food pantry option is easier. The soup kitchen option is easier. You know, why, why should we care about those things? Like if I have a couple extra bucks, you know, I'm going to need that to get my bus to, to go to work or to do whatever. And so I have found that really one of the main things is really giving power to people in that community so that they can explain it to, to their friends and why it matters. And not for me, you know, to be up there like kale salad is delicious. Trust me. Um, so I think that that's been really one of the biggest things that I've learned along the way is that my power and knowledge that I have um, has really allowed me to take a step back and um, just try to provide the space, providing the safe space to be, um, providing a space in the city, especially where you can feel like you can come and there's not, you know, these white people looking over like, oh, what you pick and make sure you're not picking that. Or at the same time, coming from a volunteer based or was more traditionally volunteer based organization um, to not ask black people to volunteer to farm for you if you are white. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it. Um, people have uh, people of color done enough free labor, especially in the fields. And if you you know want to get them engaged to grow that food again, that the number one way to do it is to give them the land. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, so these are just a few of my topics. I don't know, I might have run out of time, but I would be happy to talk about that more. Beautiful, thank you, Montana. Um, yeah, I really love you naming the disconnect that's so common between organizations sometimes and participants or members or people that the organizations serve. Um, and how to really go about that shift in changing model and looking at racial justice within all of that. So I appreciate that perspective a lot. Thank you for bringing that to us. Um, and just a reminder to folks, you can submit questions in the Q&A um, or also use the chat. And our final panelist is Aletha Dale Micolo who is a citizen of Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago and lives on the island of Hawaii. She is an educator, writer, and documentary filmmaker who is passionate about social justice for all living beings. Her formal education includes a BA in psychology and women's studies from San Diego State University, a postgraduate teaching certificate for English language arts from, Hawaii, from University of Hawaii, and a certificate in documentary filmmaking from Yavapai College and an MA in social justice and community organizing from Prescott College. Her past documentary projects and writing address issues like food justice, carnival, immigration, colonization, and the first peoples of the Caribbean. She is currently working on her PhD in sustainability education at Prescott College. Most of the time, she lives in the picturesque village of Hanamu with her partner, Orlando, and their two cats, Bentley and Nakuna. 
Hey. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So, oh, sorry. I'm a little nervous, sorry. I wanted, aloha, my name is Alita Dale McCullough. I wanted to, um, before I begin, acknowledge that I live on a work on the traditional lands and territories of the Kanaka Oevi, the Yavapai, the Yavapai Apache, and the Hokam peoples. I'm a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago and a resident of Hawaii for 20 years. I also spend a great deal of time in Prescott Valley, Arizona, because my mom, my mom lives there. And so um, I'll actually be there in October for two, two months. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm new to all of this organizing. Um, I was in class with Montana and with Ren, and they were such great role models in showing me just how, you know, just how to just get started, right? Because we all have to get started. So I do want to acknowledge them. And um, I'm happy to be here with all of you and learning and hopefully sharing some information as well. So I'm just going to go through the questions that we were given. Um, I'm in school right now, which is a full-time job. I'm getting my, um, I'm studying sustainability education. Um, so a lot of what, you know, we're talking about today is stuff that I read about and, and you know, think about and study about quite a bit. Um, I also teach. I am, um, I've taught middle school for eight years, but um, now I've been teaching at Prescott College. I've taught um, the research class, advocacy research, and in the fall, I'll be teaching grant writing. And I've done like the radical media class too, where we learned how to um, look at uh, media that's used for social justice movements. Um, sometimes I do some freelance grant writing. Um, I just started this, this is kind of new. So I'm learning that feel, like how to do reports and stuff like that. I did some writing for the Mauna Kea Defense Fund that's here in Hawaii. Um, and the main thing, one of the things that I do that I want to talk about today is um, I'm a volunteer at the food bank. We actually call it the food basket. And I, I, um, I get so much satisfaction. Um, actually, Tuesday is my food basket day. But um, because of COVID, we're actually kind of scaling back on how many times volunteers go in. Because one of the things that I do is um, I travel with Dina, who's amazing, amazing young woman. And we drive, an amazing young person, we drive from uh, Hilo in Hawaii if you don't, and maybe you might know, but we go all the way through Volcano, we go to Ocean View, we go all the way up to Konos, and then we come over the saddle. So it is an all day thing. We start at eight in the morning, we're done by about 3.30, you know, if we're lucky. So, um, but I didn't do it today, so that's why I was able to be here um, with the panel. So, um, the, I wanted to talk a little bit about, about the food basket um, I was doing, and this is all information that's based on the people that work there, like my friend Zoe um, Banfield. Um, so the food basket has been around since uh, 1989. Its mission is to end hunger um, by being a model for food security and sustainability. Um, people go there, they have emergency once a week food distributions that see between 200 to 400 families showing up for food, um, about 10 to 80 people a day, it, it varies, a day comes to the warehouse for emergency food and there are two warehouses, one's in Hilo, one's in Kona. Um, we also have a lot of similar programs um, that, I'm sorry, the prior um, participant talked about like they do in Arizona. So um, the one I do that I help with is a CSA program called the, Bo the Box, where we're able to deliver fresh, um, beautiful vegetables, papayas, fresh honey, um, mushrooms, lots of beautiful greens. Um, and people are able to use, if they use their EBT, it comes up to, I think, about $32 a month. If you don't, it's twice twice that. But right now, there's a waiting list for that, and that's really popular. Um, but we also have, um, like, um, so, yeah, so, like, for the box, there's a 450 customers, right? And, um, and then there's also, like, a monthly Kapuna pantry. So Kapuna is our elderly, and this is food for the elderly. And that sees over a thousand customers. 
um, I wanted to share some stats about Hawaii and food security. Be because we are so isolated, um, I think we're about 2,500 miles away from our nearest um, imported food source, right? And you would think that we grow a lot of food here, but actually, um, at one time we did before contact, before um, the arrival of, um, you know, Captain Cook and um, the Europeans before that, there was, um, the islands were self-sufficient, they had to be, right? And um, there was very advanced agriculture going on. But right now the stats show that 85 to 90% of our food is imported, it comes from off island because we're 2,500 miles away from our food source. And then there are things like um, kind of colonial rules like the Jones Act, which means that you can only um, ship food in ships that are made in the USA. So that, that brings up the price of food, right? Uh, so food is expensive here. Just add about, you know, $2 to everything you buy, like at, um, at your grocery store there. Like, you know, if you go to Sprouts, just add a couple dollars on and that's what we're paying. 36% um, of residents earn less than a livable wage in Hawaii. Um, it's very, uh, the cost of paradise is very expensive. Rent is expensive. If you live on a Oahu, you are paying probably over $1,000 for a studio or one bedroom apartment. And if you have children, you know, just imagine um, 36, like I said that already, 61% of families are, um, have children that are struggling to pay their uh, bare necessities. Um, that's, you know, that's another thing here. Um, we have 25% of our population um, with diabetes. And this is despite our state being the number one in health nationally. So if, if we have 25%, imagine the other states. Um, we have, um, our, our food insecurity is 11.8%, which is lower than the na national average. And about one in five receive food assistance. We have about 50,000 kids on SNAP benefits. Um, so 19.5% 19, 19 of um, recipients in Hawaii receiving SNAP are children. 80% of our kids receive reduced and free lunch. And during COVID, what we've been seeing is um, schools have been preparing meals and um, families have been picking up so they can pick up um, breakfast and lunch if, they're, if, they're, um, if their kids, their kiki, are not in the schools. And our schools are all remote right now um, because of COVID. Um, what else? Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how the work has changed because of the pandemic. Um, we've had about 10,000 cases of COVID in Hawaii have been identified. In Hawaii, on our island though, because I live on the island of Hawaii, um, the state has 10,000 cases and we have about 517 cases um, on the island that I live on. 21 are hospitalized. Um, speaking with my friend Zoe, who's the quality assurance director at the Food Basket, um, she said it's been crazy. She used that term crazy since COVID, more needs. Um, there's been much more need. People receiving food assistance um, benefits, SNAP benefits have increased by 20% over here. But then um, the feedback is also getting calls about EBT being canceled because people are getting um, their unemployment benefits. So the unemployment benefits seem to be canceling out EBT benefits. And then when the unemployment benefits um, stop, then they have to reapply for, for EBT. And a lot of people who call the food bank, they're elderly. Um, they, they, might, they might have some type of you know, um, you know, disability, or you know, they're, you know, they just maybe they don't even have good internet. So these things just create more and more, you know, problems, right? Um, yeah, and, and then a lot of people are living in we live in a rural community here, you know, and people have health issues and no internet, you know, it's no no extra um, computer to do homework and things like that. So um, the last thing I do want to talk about is transforming um, food systems so that um, so they look so that they're more equitable. Um, I think uh, one way we have to address economic inequality. Uh, people workers have to have a living wage to live in Hawaii. Um, if you earn less than a hundred thousand dollars in Hawaii for a uh, two-family household. A, a parent, two parent household with two kids, you have to earn over $100,000 to be considered um, 
not living under poverty, okay? That's ridiculous. We need more jobs. You know, maybe we can have more jobs in agriculture, and that is happening. We need to support um, entrepreneurship that has to do with ag products. I taught at a local um, Hawaiian-focused charter school for four years, and a lot of my students, uh, rather than going to college, um, they started small businesses that had to do with farming. Some people, one of my students, Malie, she makes teas, you know, she has a tea company. You know, she was on television the other day. Um, my other friend, Iini, is growing lo'i. Uh, she's growing the taro and the lo'i, you know. They're, they're going to the land. The young people are going to the land. And, and it's a beautiful thing to see because you know it had to do with their education, like a Hawaiian focused, culturally focused, place-based education. And that's why they're making these um, really good decisions. Um, every $1 uh, spent on supplies can produce $25%, $25 worth of food. So uh, more people are farming and maybe we need to look at this in Hawaii as a, as a way forward. We also need to create resilient food systems so we don't have to import over 80% of our food. Um, if we were to reduce our imports by 70%, that would create, that would give us 10% to play with. We would create... 2300 jobs you know um for people that live here um that would help um the biggest thing though that i do want to leave with is and the reason i'm studying sustainability education is i'm very interested in how our ancestors dealt with things i feel um it's very important and now is the time we should have been doing this a long time ago but we need to look at what the ancestors did how did they interact with the land um so a couple things um a, a couple of people i want to just mention before i leave um arundhati roy is um she's an indian she's a writer from india um she wrote this beautiful essay and she talked about the pandemic being a portal the portal and and the portal being a time we can we can go through this and we can leave the carcasses of um, things that don't work behind and, and, and go with the new knowledge and also take the, the, the ancient knowledge, um, the knowledge of our ancestors. So for example, in Trinidad, you always grow peas with corn, right? They, they go well together and all of our um, systems, our food systems, we need to look back at what our, um, at, at what our grandparents, our great grandparents did. Um, I was reading a wonderful article um, uh, yesterday um, about the honorable harvest. Um, this was um, this is work done presented by Robin Kimmerer and how and just just the way that we harvest food and our relationship with food and um, things like you know just just gratitude and thanking the plant and reciprocity, giving back to the land. Um, these are the things that you know are I feel. These, this is where we need to go. Um, Winona LaDuke is another person, you know, um, she writes a lot about being good ancestors so that we can, um, we can sustain ourselves and uh, future generations. So um, thank you again so much. I really appreciate and um, look forward to working with you guys in the future. Aloha, bye-bye. Thank you so Aloha. much. I talk so fast, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, that was, that was amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. I was like, I got a whole, you know, many pages just from listening. So you covered a lot. Um, yeah, you really, I love those quotes, that idea of the pandemic being a portal. Um, you just blew my mind a little bit. Um, Thank you for that. And for talking about, you know, Hawaii before colonization and ancestors and all of the pieces that you uh, wove together. So I'm going to go ahead and um, pull up some of the questions and we can open up to more of a discussion. I'll also go back to gallery view here. So, okay, let's see. Some have been answered. Um, there's one question about lack of transportation. Um, lack of transportation is a huge issue for reaching food. Prescott does not have public transportation. Thoughts on how to change that reality. And Rebecca, if you want to do that, I saw you already had added a little. 
Yeah. Um, so SIMPO, I always forget their acronyms, Central Yavapai Metropolitan Planning Organization, um, is the is the name of the game here in Yavapai County. Uh, I would say Western Yavapai County. Eastern Yavapai or Verde Valley has the CAT transit system and has actually had public transit for quite a number of years. Um, but Western Yavapai tends to have different politics than Eastern Yavapai for those of you that have been in this county for a while. Um, so uh, yes, Tra let, let me put it this way. Kathleen and I both grew up here. Um, transportation has been an issue our entire lives in this area. So that the feasibility of that changing overnight is small. However, I think there's a lot of movement and push from different um, sectors of our community that are really making transportation a forefront issue. I would love to say that that issue is food and food access, but it's totally not. <laughs> it's more of housing and expansion uh, into more outlying areas and people wanting to be able to commute and um, hop on a bus or a ride share in a way that benefits their lifestyle. Um, Simpo has a plan and an outline of their rollout. It has been delayed due to COVID, but I believe they're still trying to do a 2021 launch. Um, very much of the main corridors that we know of. So 69 connecting Prescott to PV, tiny bit of 89 North. Um, frustratingly enough, they want to stop right at the airport and not go any further into Chino and that area, which has a lot of political ramifications around it. Um, and then one day a week going to uh, Dewey Humboldt area. Um, so kind of bridging out into that more rural area. So um, they kind of have finished their public participation weigh-in process, um, but I would urge you to still follow that group. Um, Chris Bridges is just amazing advocate for transportation work. He's super vocal. Um, find him on LinkedIn. He posts all the time about transportation woes in Yavapai County. Um, but I, I would say be very loud and vocal with your elected representatives about transportation. I always put in surveys that ask residents like, what would adequate transportation look like for you? And for me, my answer is always, I would be riding public transit. I would not own a vehicle. I would be riding it. Um, and until we get to that point, I think we have a lot of ground to cover. Um, in terms of food access, it's, it's a major uphill. Um, I think what Organizations like Kathleen with Prescott Farmers Market, Pinnacle Prevention as a statewide group, um, looking more into uh, fresh mobile express type systems. So kind of like what Meals on Wheels does with delivering food to homebound people. Um, fresh Express would take that food box model and have specific routes that deliver um hopefully local food, but definitely fresher food to certain areas of need throughout the county. Um, so yes, there's, there's a lot of, I guess there's a lot of ideas in the making. Um, as always, it comes down to money. Um, so if you can lobby your representatives to say, hey, I want you to spend dollars here, the more of us saying that, I think the better. Thank you. Um, all right, here's another one. I subscribe to the tenant that food is indeed a justice issue and the intersectionality of food with racism, the climate crisis, and the environment is receiving more and more attention. Thank you all for what you do. Could anyone perhaps speak to that intersectionality a bit more? So I'll just put that out to any of the panelists that want to address. Um, I guess I can. Um, I mean, yes, they're very hand in hand, all sorts, food, environmental, 
all, I mean, all these social justice issues are, um, but I think speci specifically with race, I think obviously Native Americans are the easiest example because it was directly their land, but also taking other people from their land. Um, I think for me, when I think food, by the way, I just automatically think the land. I just kind of skip right to the land part because um, that's where the food comes from. But yeah, I think reconnecting, allowing people to reconnect um, who have been marginalized and oppressed and literally taken from their land and uprooted from their ability um, to provide for their own lives, I think makes food one of the most important things to have that freedom to provide for their own food uh, with, with their own land and having that ability. Um, I think that would be one of the biggest changes that we could make in terms of racial oppression in our country is if we gave people of color land. Very well said, Montana. <laughs> Do any other panelists want to also speak to that? I would just say like from the agricultural like research perspective, um, which is very much a bubble and has a lot of inherent issues with it. Um, but seeing a major shift at the mega universities with research dollars going towards um, crops, specialized crops that are desert adapted, drought tolerant, heat resistant, et cetera. Um, and that being a pretty massive change um, compared to what's been done in the past decades. And so I, I think of it kind of as ironic because it's this circling back to a lot of more um, indigenous, indigenous native ways of growing food in areas that historically have been hard to grow in like the Southwest. Um, and so seeing a lot of mega dollars go towards that sort of, um, that sort of research. So, which only tells me that policy isn't far behind um, advocating for agricultural change on that mega massive scale that takes climate into consideration. Um, you see this with California right now because it's on fire um, and the amount of growing places that are affected by that, it hits the bottom line. And so when it hits the bottom line, we start seeing shifts in the larger systems. Um, so I think both the climate crisis, but also the public health crisis of COVID is like a really opportune moment for those of us that have these varied educational backgrounds to really advocate for um, these whole, more holistic, inclusive ideas of change. Um, it's, very, it's very much, um, who is it? Is it Naomi Campbell that does, um, oh, was it like disaster? Disaster Economics. There's a book. I'll look it up. I'll put it in the chat. <laughs> okay, here's one. How to successfully grow food on my deck. Maybe, Amanda, do you want to start with that one with the backyard <laughs> gardening movement? Yeah, you know, I, I can take that. Um, you know, with my own garden, I, I actually do not have the appropriate soil in my yard so what i had to do um was build raised beds and so when i'm thinking of a patio if you don't have you know a large lawn or anything like that uh, pot gardening is um i think would be appropriate you can grow um tomatoes you can grow peppers you know i've seen uh, people grow squash you know just just things single plants in single pots. So I, I really hope that um, helps out a little. Beautiful. Okay, we have another one. Thanks for all of the work um, you're doing. Amazing. I've never heard of the nonprofit industrial complex, which Montana mentioned, which sounds scary. Please explain briefly, does it, does it affect your work? It is scary. <laughs> well, basically, it's kind of just the what nonprofit model for our country really is. Um, I mean, there are still small scale nonprofits that might be funded with just some local money. Um, 
but for the most part, nonprofits in our country are funded by the largest corporations in the world that are also doing the most damage generally because they have the most extra money to give. Um, and anybody that's worked with a number of nonprofits probably has accepted some dirty money from time to time. Um, but that's okay. Keep taking the money until you can get some other money. Um, but basically, yeah, it's the idea that these large corporations have this excess money due to exploiting labor under capitalism. They then use that money to basically take organizers and radical movement of people and kind of confine it and reform it down into a whitewashed um, professional career of reform. So you can redirect Actus Energy to kind of be more career-based um, and kind of organizing for small incremental change or reform within the organization to keep people or those organizers or people in general from mass-based organizing of the actual people to work for jobs um, that pay them well. So it also, the state also works with them to basically keep um, responsibility of their own problems like food and healthcare and those kind of things away from the state. And they keep that money private in a private hands, give it to private nonprofits, and then say, oh, we're going to have these nonprofits take care of the food issues, you know, make up for not having enough SNAP benefits and all of those things. But really, that money is still in the private hands. Um, so, you know, that control is theirs and the amount of food and money that is given out, basically. Um, do you think, does that answer the question? Yes, <laughs> we're getting some nods, we're getting some preach it from the chat. So yeah, I think you did. Um, um, <laughs> thanks, Montana. Okay, we'll take a couple more. So there's a question, how do water needs fit with more local food? I, that's a big question, but um, I'll take a stab at it. I mean, what, obviously water is an issue here. Um, I remember several years ago, Someone asked uh, Michael Pollan, who you might be, all be familiar with, about, you know, is using water in a place that doesn't have a lot of water better than buying food from the grocery store? And his answer was yes, because when, you, when that food travels really long distances, it's using far more resources than just the amount of water you're growing in your garden, for instance. So, um, so I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, so like when you, when you buy from local farms, you are, they are using less resources and all the farmers that I know here do use sustainable practices and, um, organic methods and things like that. So I think that that's really important and water is definitely plays into all of that. So, um, but, it, but yeah, uh, the big Chino aquifer is where most of our farmers farm and that's where they get all their, um, water. So, um, we have to keep an eye on that and do everything we can to conserve water for the future. Awesome, thanks. Kathleen, oh, and you just I brought- would, um, go, go ahead. ahead, sorry. I just wanted to add in on that. Uh, you know, I, I think you hit it right on when you had said um, more sustainable practices when it comes to whether it's gardening or farming on a large scale. And something, you know, that I've been gearing more towards, especially for my own garden, is being able to find you know a more sustainable way to water your um, your vegetables and I know one example from my uh, gardening page group we have um, a member that they plant in pots in um, regular you know the uh, the buckets the white buckets and he drilled holes in the bottom and then he ran a water line kind of like a like a little water station you know running through each of them so it's actually watered from the bottom and it goes up and so it waters the roots of the plants as opposed to you know watering um, up on the top of the soil because then we would know that you know the sun however the heat you know it, it'll evaporate so I just thought that was really neat and there's so much information out there that you could research and find more sustainable ways but I just wanted to add that in because I thought that was awesome you know we hear about drip systems and um, that's something that I'm looking more towards um, incorporating in my own garden um, next year so I 
I just wanted to add that little bit in there. And we think about rain collection, you know, and um, growing, especially here in Arizona, and depending on the climate, finding, um, planting foods that are a little bit more, you know, susceptible to the heat and um, require less water. And, you know, I think that really comes back to those, um, those indigenous practices. And, you know, part of my culture with the Hopi is they do dry farming. So for thousands of years, and I actually had this conversation with my mother this morning, we were talking about the seeds, the Hopi corn seeds, and it took them thousands of years to modify the seed to where it requires very, very, very minimal water. And so, you know, I, I really think that in, in this time and age, you know, especially those that are becoming, we can move more towards that in, in really um, being able to, because we see it all along, you know, being modifying those seeds, but I think it's something that, you know, we can do ourselves as well. So that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad you added added that in. And uh, both of those really brought back to this thread that I heard throughout all of your shares um, about different scales. And so I'm wondering if you all would talk a little bit more about, you know, how do we how do we go from, you know, an individual garden to, you know, a farm or a whole community or addressing larger, you know, state or national or across island community, um, you know, questions of accessibility. And maybe, Dale, if you have something on that, I'll throw it to you to start. That's a big question. Um, but one thing I do think that is very helpful is um, our school garden network that we have here um, in Hawaii. So from the moment I started teaching, um, I got to teach at two schools in Waimea, which is um, about an hour from Kona, if you know Kona, or like an hour and a half from Hilo. So it's kind of up country. It's very cool. There are lots of um, ranches up here. It's a place of ranching and farming and stuff like that. So the two schools are really focused on place-based education. And what that means is learning, learning a lot from your environment, learning where you are. And a big part of that was um, the garden, the malai. And this is where a lot of kids learn for the first time, you know, like, sometimes not all the time how to plant how to grow and how to develop that connection with the land so right i mean and and i think that's what i appreciated about um these two schools is that they really taught the student how to connect with the land right it's not like i have dominion over the land but it's like we're working together with the land right and we're respecting and a lot of the um, plants are seen as kukuna, they're seen as elders, right? Who are there to teach and guide. Um, so I really do think it, like the school system has a lot to do with, um, with that, you know, like that kind of, you know, that kind of learning. So yeah, that's my one thing. Does anyone else want to speak to that? And we'll probably end with any last comments that you all want to make as well. I would just piggyback on that, that all, all of this work at, at each different level is very much um, needed and complementary to, to the other systems that are at play. Um, so for a lot of my work, it looks like both and, right? So having direct education and community engagement um, with people at like an individual level, how do you can food? How do you plant a garden, you know, above 5,500 feet? Um, what's happening to my tomatoes, right? So that individual kind of one-on-one -on -one education and resource distribution and then getting into how do we organize around growing spaces? Uh, what do you city codes and ordinances look like in the places that we live and work and play? Um, and then is that reality reflected in the policies and the built environments in which we find ourselves, right? 
I think um, it's really telling that we can stand in a grocery store line and what's on either side of us, it's like sugar in two forms, right? It's either like sugar sweetened beverages, right? AKA soda, or it's like candy bars. And imagine what our world would look like if the policy and lobbying groups that dictate those spaces said, hold on, only fresh local food needed to be on either side when you check out at the grocery store, right? Like how drastically that would change um, how we are at each of these levels, right? Like I would, I would, like kind of Montana was saying, I want to work myself out of a job. I don't want to have the necessity of SNAP education because we have an obesity epidemic, right? Like let's get that under control. Let's instead um, spend money for local backyard gro growing initiatives and less money for you know, subsidized crops that make us fat and slowly kill us. So all, all of it, both and, right? The individual and then up the chain to larger conversations, I think is really important. Thank you. Yeah, and some folks are dropping um, resources in the chat. Thanks for doing that. Um, and also, if you missed it, there was a couple of questions that did get answered in Q&A, if you want to um, click on that and see it. And I will, oh, my cat wants to say hello. Um, and I will put my email address in the chat in case folks have more um, questions that didn't get answered and you want to be connected with any of the panelists. Um, and I'm also going to put some other uh, resources and links here in the chat. Um, there's the link to the Empty Bowls website um, where you can go and order a bowl um, to participate in this event some more. Um, the first pickup day is September 13th and the second is the 19th. So you can go to the website and order a bowl and choose which pickup day. You can also participate in the um, spin we're doing. Um, and we're going to have a celebration on the 13th over Zoom also, which I'll put the link in here. Um, and that will be to, you know, celebrate this whole event. Um, and also that's where the drawing is going to happen. So those are a couple ways to participate. I do ask that folks consider making a donation to the food banks and I and then also really um, take to heart what we've heard tonight um, in terms of, you know, thinking about our own lives and how we are contributing to, you know, maintaining food insecurity or contributing to transformation and being able to hold those both ands, um, being able to hold the needs that are very present in our community right now, and also the vision that our panelists offered us tonight about what, you know, food sovereignty and food sustainability and transformation of our food systems can look like in the future. So I really do believe we can hold both of those things at the same time, and I encourage you to do that. And I ask that you consider making a donation. Um, it will go to the food banks and folks will get that food who are experiencing hunger. Um, and there's other ways to participate as well. So also um, we'll just say thank you so much again to all of the panelists and to Carrie and to NASCA for co-sponsoring. Um, and I hope that this is, you know, one of many future ongoing conversations that all of us and others can engage in. Um, I feel like we could have, you know, a marathon panel and just keep talking. There's so much more we didn't even really get to go into. So, um, but I know that folks are tired of Zoom and um, probably want to get off and maybe go eat dinner. So anyway, I will thank you all so much and um, hope you have a really good evening.